Uh, my name is Harry Cutner, and I am the Calumet coordinator with the Wetlands Initiative. And give me just a moment, and I will share my screen on this new meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you all for having us tonight. Um, so, as I said, I'm with the Wetlands Initiative. Um, we are one of the partners on the Little Calumet River Conservation Collaborative. Uh, it also consists of Audubon Great Lakes. We have Daniel Suarez here from Audubon Great Lakes. Lake County Parks, City of Gary, the Nature Conservancy. Those are our core partners, but we've also been working with NIPSCO. Uh, I'm obviously very closely with the commission. Um, so uh, I'm here, Daniel and I are here to uh, provide a year in report of how things are going so far. Uh, you know, so let's get started. Okay, so I'm going to sort of go over sort of the nuts and bolts of what's been happening on the ground, and then Daniel will provide a little bit more context for what that means overall. Um, so uh, the Wellens Initiative has been managing the contractor work this year. Um, so we started off the year um, with having last season's treated Phragmites mowed at Highland Rookery and Chase Street Wetlands. Now, ideally, uh, that Phragmites would have been burned in a prescribed burn. Uh, but that was not an option this year. Uh, at the Gary, Indiana properties, uh, the city of Gary has a moratorium on prescribed burning in 2022 for air quality reasons. And then at Highland Rookery, uh, the Nature Conservancy uh, decided that it wasn't a great idea to burn due to some community concerns right in the neighborhood. So we need to spend more time building relationships with the local neighborhood on that property. Um, so here up on the screen is Chase Street Wetland. Uh, in between Chase and Grant Street. Um, so this spring we mowed 27 acres uh, last season's frag. So that image down at the bottom, it's a pretty good panor panoramic view of what that looked like in July. Um, September this year, we have uh, Fragmite's retreatment planned using a Marshmaster for contractors. Uh, this retreatment is about half as expensive as initial treatments that have happened in the past years, mostly because in these next images, you can see that Phragmites has really thinned out. So that first image on the left is taken a few weeks after mowing occurred before the growing season. And then that image on the right. I'm sorry to interrupt, but Phragmites are invasive species. Yes. Why are we spending so much time? You know, people yes. keep asking me why I spend time on this. Why do I spend time on this? Yeah, so Phragmites uh, common reed is honestly the nastiest invasive plant species that we have in the region. It's also all across North America, uh, but it chokes out native vegetation, uh, which ultimately leads to decrease in wildlife habitat. Um, Honestly, it's an eyesore also for the public. When a site is overrun with Phragmites, folks can't even take a walk in a preserve. So trying to get rid of that Phragmites, make room for native vegetation and restore some of these wetland systems. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, really quickly. So that image on the right, that's, that's just a month ago. And as you can see, there's not a whole lot of Phragmites regrowth, which is exactly what we're looking for, which is why uh, retreatment cost is a lot less. Uh, looking over at Highland Rookery uh, in Highland, Indiana, we had planned to mow. Uh, this is at Clyde in the board, folks, just so you know. Thank you. So this is, we had, we had planned to mow that area, the entire site, uh, but due to a lot of rain uh, this spring when we were trying to mow, uh, and then also some nesting uh, marsh bird concerns, which uh, Commissioner Nimitz brought to our attention, uh, we ultimately decided to cut that mowing short, uh, mostly to preserve those, those nesting bird species because Highland Rookery does get a lot of bird use and it's a big asset to that neighborhood. So we mowed 26 acres. Um, that photograph uh, that I have up is just showing again in July, that seemed to be a really effective treatment. So a couple years of, of herbicide work and then mowing really seemed to knock that back. Um, coming up in September, September, we also have retreatment planned across the site. Um, but again, just like Chase Street, that Phragmites is looking a lot thinner. So that image on the left is summer 2020. 
in that background that's full of Phragmites as well as um, some cattails. But that same area, slightly different view, but the same area, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, actually this was last week, I was out there with uh, Mr. Zanstra. There's very little regrowth. It looks like hell, unfortunately, because of all that dead standing Phragmites. And that's why we want to either burn it or mow it uh, this coming winter. But good sign there's very little regrowth in there. When you mow them down, will they deteriorate and break down? Yeah, so that that's over time they will biodegrade. It'll take a couple of years, which is why burning, that's one of the big benefits of burning. You get rid of it right away. Uh, it lets light and heat from the sun penetrate the ground and allows native species to germinate, things like that. <coughs> um, so it's not ideal to mow, but mowing seems to be effective and it'll just take a little bit longer for that to break down. Is there, is there a way when you mow, you could actually harvest it, so to speak, and, so, and dispose of it? Burn it? Burn it? It's bundles. Yeah, it's it's not a very common service and it's not very cost effective. But um, there are some local uh, universities that have, you know, been researching that, and it's something that in the field is developing. But right now, it's not cost effective, and there's not really many businesses that even provide that service, unfortunately. Um, and then looking at MLK Martin Luther King South Wetland. Um, which is in city of Gary. It's in between Georgia Street and Martin Luther King Drive. Um, this site is developing really well. This has been the main focus of the Lake County Parks Restoration Crew, which you all gener generously fund. Um, so these are two different photos. On the left, up in the top, we have uh, a view from the outlet channel at the northwest corner. You see there's not a lot of vegetation. We're mostly seeing Phragmites um, on the left there. But this year, we did planting about a year ago. And you can see that same area, it's full of cattails, which is great habitat for nesting birds and muskrats. Um, and we're seeing native vegetation develop. Um, that photo down at the bottom is an image of pickerel weed, which is a great native species. So essentially, uh, as we remove these invasive species, we're seeing some of those early successional natives popping up in the seed bank. So we did plug planting in there, but we're also seeing at this site a lot of things that have just historically been in the soil that are starting to germinate, which is exactly what we want to see. Is, is this south of the expressway? Yes, it's uh, just south of I-80. Okay. Um, this is another view of the northeast corner. So back in 2020, again, we've got Phragmites, not a whole lot growing in there. And then just a month ago, that same area is full of cattails, full of early successional native species. Uh, I included that photo of duck potato, which is uh, some people call it arrow, arrow root also. Um, but it's a really showy, beautiful white flower. It's exactly what we want to see. Um, so that area has been opened up. The Lake County Parks crew has been hitting invasives in there. They removed a whole bunch of woody species like buckthorn and honeysuckle. And we've got our very first volunteer uh, plug planting scheduled about a month from now with one of our other partners at, at IU Northwest. Uh, Professor Spencer Courtright has been uh, one of our partners along the way. So his restoration ecology class is going to come out. So we're planting about 2,000 plugs in that area, which is a little less than an acre, as well as the southeast corner of the property, which is sort of a, a remnant sedge meadow that has historically been in the site. Um, so that photo on the bottom right, on the right, is that area has been pretty much cleared out of invasives by uh, Lake County Parks crew. That's been a huge area of focus for them this year. And then that image on the left is we're working with the city of Gary to get permitting for aerial herbicide application at that site. Uh, MLK South has a lot of downed logs. It's really hard to get in there with, with work crews. So using a helicopter is uh, the most cost-effective and, and, and work-effective option. Um, just a couple updates on the crew. I know Mr. Zamstra might have some more to add, and he, he comes in every month, but the Lake County Parks crew has been really crucial and key in this work. Uh, we're still in a phase 
the front end phase of these projects where obviously you all are pouring in a lot of dollars to contract to work. Uh, we're also, uh, you know, matching a lot of those funds through a uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant. But the Lake County Parks crew is filling in all those other spaces. They're there year round, 40 hours a week out there. Um, so we really appreciate that work. Um, our partnership has been keeping up monthly field visits uh, with the crew leader, Emily. Um, and that's been really key as, you know, just giving her advice on what she should be focusing on. Uh, and she's our eyes on the ground. So she points out when there's, you know, problem invasive species cropping up in certain areas. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, another exciting thing is we secured a $5,000 NIPSCO environmental action grant, basically to buy chainsaws, brush cutters, backpack sprayers, and some safety equipment for that crew. And then also some of that funding is going towards some field training for the crew, basically professional development so they can do their job better and more effectively. And then lastly, um, the next phase of this work, which is what I presented on six months ago, is the installation of two water control structures, one at Martin Luther King South and one at Highland Rookery. We are still in the permitting phase of that project. Um, that process is, has honestly taken a lot longer than we expected. Probably not, probably not yeah. a surprise to you, yeah. <laughs> Good news though, we did receive our uh, IDEM 401 permit for Martin Luther King South. Highland Rookery is still under review. Uh, and then a couple of weeks from now, uh, Dr. Gary Sullivan and I are meeting with the Army Corps at both sites uh, to look at the properties and all indications from our meetings with them up until now is that they will approve both of those structures. Um, so that's where things are at now. Uh, TWI has been developing an RFP for both projects. Uh, we've gotten a list of contractors uh, from Mr. Zanstra and we'll put out a public uh, call for proposals once that gets approved. Fingers crossed we can still get these in later this year. Um, but that's where things are at on that, basically. Are the, are, there are the permits that you require just from the core, or are there also state and local permits? Yeah, so so uh, 404 and a 408 from the Army Corps, and then uh, individual 401 from Indiana Department of Environmental Management. Those are the three permits for each project. Thank you. Um, that's what I've got for today. Uh, Daniel will come up and give us a little more context. At where we're One at. second. For what was just presented, any questions or comments for uh, this young man? Appreciate the update. I thought it was outstanding. Yeah. Um, help me, um, Mrs. Lambert, with regards to Zoom land. Any those gentlemen have any questions? Our commissioners I'm speaking with specifically. They could also say no, because I don't see your faces. No? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Daniel Suarez, uh, Conservation Manager for Audubon Great Lakes, here to provide a little bit more context. I'm just going to start about the, the monitoring work, because the monitoring uh, work of the secretive marsh birds has been the basis of all of this work. We've been using the secretive marsh birds as the indicator for overall marsh bird health. So, Simply the presence or absence of certain focal species can indicate to us whether we're on the right track or whether we need to uh, adjust our approach. So just in 2022, we haven't crunched all of the numbers yet. That'll come uh, likely six months from now or the next time that we're here. But I just wanted to give kind of a, an overview of what we've been doing. Uh, we have three volunteers that are covering all of our monitoring points across MLK South, uh, Grant Street, uh, Chase Street Wetlands, and Highland Heron Rookery. Uh, the surveys uh, require three visits uh, to monitor birds starting in uh, the beginning of May. There's a period, the first half of May, where you make one visit, the second half of May, you make a second visit, and the first half of June, you make a third visit. Um, and then there's an additional vegetation monitoring component so that we know if a particular spot is really good for birds, we can look at the vegetation data and say, what's going on here? How can we replicate this in other places? Each site has a different number of survey points depending on how large it is, but those 27 survey points represent uh, over 150 hours of volunteer uh, 
volunteer contributions to this effort. So without the volunteers, we just wouldn't know uh, how things are progressing. Just to kind of reiterate some of the things that Harry said, I wanted to compare 2021 and 2022, what we've seen so far. So this is a view uh, similar to the one you saw from Harry at MLK South. This is the Northwest corner looking east. And 2021 was really marked by low water levels. We had low water levels across the board, which is really, really important in terms of germination and revegetation, like Harry was showing. When we draw those water levels down, all of those seeds that have been waiting in the soil, as much as a century of research shows, uh, you, you create the right conditions, those seeds can, can germinate and come back. And so we see a lot of bare ground over here, but that bare ground is opportunity for, for native species to colonize and flourish. And so last year, like Barry was saying, this is the area where we did some plug planting across all of the monitoring sites, across all three visits, we had 361 focal bird species detection. So if uh, we heard the bird or saw the bird uh, of the 11 focal species, there were 361 instances. In 2022, we had 558 focal species detections. So that's almost a 200, uh, almost 200 more detections than uh, 2021. And this year, we've seen higher water levels than we did last year, but still below average. Um, so we know that a lot of the, uh, the, the, the increase in detections came from Sora and Virginia rail. Um, those are really good species to have uh, increases in. And uh, it's really encouraging for the, the trajectory of this work. The majority of the detections uh, that we saw were in that first monitoring period from uh, the first half of May, which indicates to us that a lot of those birds might not necessarily be nesting in these sites, but they're mi mi migratory species. So some of them might be going as far north as the Arctic Circle, but 200 more detections over last year shows that even if it's for migrants, we're creating habitat that birds are actively using. We would have seen uh, similar numbers last year if the conditions were right, but the combination of lower water levels and the germination of native species has given the birds a lot more uh, habitat and food sources and places to rest on their, on their migration journey. Just can't uh, emphasize this enough, uh, the progress that we're seeing in areas where Phragmites has been treated. So on the left, this is a, a, another photo uh, of an area where previously it had been uh, dominated by Phragmites. Now we're seeing native species like rice cut grass, uh, duck potato, like Harry was saying, water parsnip, things that are really, really encouraging and things that at some sites, you simply don't have those species in the seed bank and you need to either buy seeds or you need to plant plugs them. So we're starting from a really good place here and we're seeing a lot of good results. On the right photo, you can actually see that's a ton of water parsnips coming up in an area with a lot of those dead stems behind being being dead frag fragmites. So this doesn't mean that we've that that we've won that we've won yet that there isn't any threat, but the trajectory on between contractors, the eyes on the ground of our partnership, the Lake County Parks crew, we've got the system in place to keep these places continuing to improve. Uh, last month or six months ago when I was here, we were talking about just starting to embark on the development of management plans for all three sites. So uh, we're starting with uh, MLK South, Highland Heron Rookery, and uh, Chase Street Wetlands. We are nearing the end of that process. We've almost got drafts of all three uh, management plans put together. Uh, we have a core team that has been working on those. So that's Audubon, Lake County Parks, the Nature Conservancy, and the Wetlands Initiative. Once we get those um, management plans in a good place, we'll send those over to, to Mr. Repay to distribute to all of you to give us feedback. We see these, these documents as serving multiple purposes. One, to help the Lake County Parks crew when they're out in the field just understand uh, what they should be looking for, what the annual sequence of events can be. Very important training tool for any new staff members that are brought on board to kind of orient them. But also, these documents are likely going to be important for you all. Uh, as, you, as you look over these documents, uh, you'll, you'll get a better understanding of the trajectory that these sites are on, some of the decision-making points that exist there, but also just a summary of the resources as they currently exist and a trajectory of about 10 years from now into the future. So these will be really important, not just for folks that, that are doing it on the ground, but the planners, the fundraisers, and everyone in between. Uh, this work, uh, you know, at, at, uh, within the, the Little Cal uh, Basin, 
also dovetails with some work that we've been doing at Hatcher Park. So Hatcher Park sits, I'm gonna have a slide in a little bit that shows uh, the extent of the, well, the area we're calling Marshalltown Marsh, which has joint ownership. Uh, different parcels are owned by the Lake County or the, the, the Little Cal Commission. Others are owned by uh, City of Gary. So we've been doing a lot of community outreach in the Gary area, uh, connecting folks with Hatcher Park and by proxy in the future, uh, to Marshalltown Marsh. We want to make sure that we're including uh, community in, in decision making and uh, future visioning because if we're successful in, in fundraising and doing work in Marshalltown Marsh, Hatcher Park is likely going to be the main gateway for folks to access that area. So we're uh, currently in the process of firming up our uh, memorandum of understanding with City of Gary so that we can hire contractors and get them out there this fall uh, starting invasive species work. And we're also uh, planning a lot of community focused events through our Wild Indigo program, which is working to co-develop programs, environmental education and stewardship at Hatcher Park. And uh, Harry has been helping lead up an effort uh, collaboration with the US Forest Service and the Student Conservation Association. So two partners that haven't traditionally been involved in our uh, Little Cal work but are interested and already active in the area. And so just east of Hatcher Park is the Bethune Early Childhood Development Center. Uh, the US Forest Service and Student Conservation Association have a program called Community, which prioritizes uh, working with communities and increasing tree canopy, not just uh, for beautification efforts, but to reduce urban heat islands, to make our communities more resilient in the face of climate change. And on September 30th, we've got a tree planting event uh, focused at Bethune. Um, and the habitat between Hatcher Park, Bethune, and uh, Marshalltown Marsh, we, we can consider that a contiguous block of habitat. So by Bethune electing to plant some trees uh, on the school property, we're just creating more habitat and a bigger buffer around Hatcher Park. Mr. Suarez, I'm sure Mr. Repay told you that we have a tree program as well. So keep that in mind as you go through those types of initiatives. Abs absolutely. We're, we're hoping that this event in September will give us a good gauge as to how much community interest there is in tree planting. So we'll definitely keep that in mind and reach out. In the past, we've also brought up um, a proposal that we were going to be putting into uh, the, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, and the Great Lakes Commission. Uh, for a feasibility study of Marshalltown Marsh. So this was going to, this, this funding opportunity uh, provides funds for, um, for feasibility study, construction and design of, of projects. And we put in the proposal at the request of NOAA officials. We've, uh, Audubon has a, an existing relationship with NOAA. We have, we've had previous projects, uh, not only in, in uh, the Illinois and Indiana region, but across the Great Lakes states. Um, unfortunately, we were not successful in getting the funding this year, although we're very uh, optimistic about the future prospects. All of the proposals that were funded in 2022 went to areas of concern across the Great Lakes states, of which Marshalltown March is not one of them. So when we asked for comments from NOAA, suggestions for how to improve our proposal, they told us apply next year, uh, it's likely that your proposal will score higher uh, just because there likely won't be another emphasis on funding areas of concern. They also told us that there is another grant that we should really strongly consider applying for called the Coastal Habitat Restoration and Resilience Grants for Underserved Communities. This grant, uh, which we'll be applying for, uh, that will go in in October, will give us funds to start a, uh, a process for uh, engaging the community residents in Marshalltown and, and across Greater Gary and helping us uh, get feedback on what residents would like to see. So obviously we'll have the opportunity to talk about our vision for creating more habitat, possible uh, re-meandering of the Little Calumet River, at least figuring out what uh, costs might be associated with that, but also uh, would give us funds to ask uh, Gary residents what kinds of recreation, what kinds of access things should we be considering. And so NOAA has told us that if we get that funding, that'll get our proposal in a much better place uh, for 2023. So hopefully by next June, I can report to you all that we've gotten that funding and that'll start us on this process of not necessarily do, touching or doing anything on the ground, but just understanding what possible future scenarios there might be. And that's uh, my last slide for you.
Outstanding. Any questions or comments for Mr. Suarez? And Mr. Mrs. Lambert, help me with the gentleman on the Zoom, please. I've got a question. Yes, sir. Mr. Nimitz. Daniel, it's nice to see you again. I appreciate your presentation as well as yours, Harry. Um, you, you talked about, I see a trajectory of improvement. You said 2021 numbers of secretive marsh bird observations have increased in this year. Now you're doing this within the Little Kevin River land. Uh, and so in the city of Gary, in the city of Highland, but you're also monitoring through volunteer efforts in the Calumet region as a whole, both Illinois and Indiana. Can you just, um, the rough numbers, mm -hmm. can you see a difference in our investment locally in the locale compared to maybe marsh birds in Illinois or maybe marsh birds in the Dunan Swale, for example? Yes, I would say that the, the combination of efforts in along the Little Cal in Indiana are uh, much more than some of the other sites we see. Some of the sites we monitor, we're simply monitoring. We're not doing anything on the ground. We're not uh, reducing invasive species. We're not putting in water control structures. The work that you've all funded is kind of an all hands on deck approach. We're hitting it not only from the invasive species side, but we're putting in the systems in place so that we don't have to wait for the water levels to drop naturally. We can artificially do that. So if we know Phragmites has snuck back in, it's gotten a foothold, we can close the water control structure, raise water levels, and effectively suffocate or drown out the Phragmites. So um, we're seeing, I, I would say, without having the, the, the raw numbers in front of me, I would say the, the site that probably performs the highest among the three is, is, is Chase Street. Um, how that compares to other sites, maybe in Illinois, I don't have that information, but I can definitely bring that for you next time we're here. But the combination of invasive species management, a dedicated crew, contractors, and putting in the water control structure, I think we'll continue seeing that trajectory kind of rise at a faster pace than we will at those other sites where there might be minimal work happening that we're not that involved with or where simply it's just monitoring. Thank you. Here, you got experience in vegetation removal and all that stuff. Yes, sir. Have you ever seen like a breaking project where you go behind a total break? Like a combine or something. Yeah, I mean, something that we can... Obviously, obviously, I'm just, I'm just a, a just a, basic guy and I rake my lawn and he patch it so it grows back greener and more. Look, so there marsh. is an attachment that, so Daniel or Harry both mentioned a, a machine called the Marsh Master. So for those that aren't aware, it is, is, it is um, an amphibious vehicle on tracks that right. you can drive out into wetlands and, and occasion open water. There's an attachment that they attach to the back that will grind the root system as well as the above standing uh, dead Phragmites. However, it still takes a long time to break down those stems naturally. Mm -hmm. And the removal cost would be extraordinary. Right. So they do have an attachment, but I think it's more specific to selective areas that are the best producing of of their goals. Yeah. Does that would you agree with that? Yes. I would. Would it would it be like uh, out of the bounds saying it's almost like harvesting bamboo? Yeah. I mean, um, there's there's research ongoing right now about turning Phragmites into biofuels, and that's a whole slippery slope where you want where you get end up getting people who are trying to plant Phragmites to grow biofuels. So um, the technology is honestly it's always it's always improving and evolving. Um, in a couple of years, there'll be more cost-effective ways to do the harvesting. We've already spoken to some contractors around the, the issue of aerial helicopter spraying. A lot of contractors are starting to work with drones, which get you much closer um, to, to sensitive areas and tree lines. Right now, those costs are really high, uh, about double what it would cost to get a helicopter out there, believe it or not. But every year, we should see those costs start lowering as it becomes more uh, second nature for these contractors to have a staff member that's a drone operator. So the technology is, is evolving as we're doing the work and um, we're always looking for the cheapest way to do it so we can hit as many acres. Economical. That's, I will say if, if I may, so I have seen the areas that you have worked. You mentioned the Highland Rookery, you mentioned MLK wetlands and Chase Creek wetlands. I have seen them every year for the last five, 10 years. 
And I will say that I am impressed with the control of invasive phragmites that you all as a collaborative have achieved over these last two years. So kudos to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, go that question. Question. I drive oh, yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Costellos. Um, first of all, I want to compliment you on the report. It's excellent. And uh, I might be, I have just two basic questions. One, uh, in your program, do you reach out to any of the schools as far as to encourage the, the youth to get involved in the environmental development of our area? And also, I'd like to know uh, what is your has the Eagles in that particular watershed program has they is the family of Eagles have they expanded? What do you know more about that? So with, with your first question, uh, with the schools, right. we do uh, reach out to schools. We're, we're starting right now with mostly community groups. And then uh, Bethune, Bethune Elementary is one example of a school that we've started making uh, good relationships with. Right. We're, as we develop programs, as we're, we're starting on this process with the city of Gary at Hatcher Park, we're going to have more regular opportunities for students to get involved. So we've just in the last couple of weeks, we posted a native plant giveaway in the city of Gary with Gary residents. There was a huge demand for, for more. So we're gonna do another one in the fall. And at those events, you get the, the grandparents the, all the way down to the grandkids there. So uh, we're starting to engage them. They're starting to be more familiar with the work that we're doing. And as we start at Hatcher Park, there's gonna be regular opportunities. It's a little tricky with sites like MLK or Highland Heron Rookery, just because of how wet and difficult to navigate those sites are. But certainly from a recreation perspective, we're hoping that in the future, we can bring people out on the water, uh, on the Little Calumet River, and do things like that, start the education process from a young age, but also work with parents and grandparents, because we know that if we can put the hooks in the kids, they're more likely to get the parents and the grandparents to, to participate. And then with, with regards to the eagles, I'm, I'm not sure which eagles you're, you're referencing at, at one of the particular sites. Right. There's a family of eagles, I think, just in Griffin, between the Griffin and the uh, West of Chase Street. Right. Oh, okay. oh, you told me that at the groundbreaking. Right. right. I just right. wanted to know that have you been, because I know that a lot is involved in the species of birds. Yeah. And I do know that we have a family of eagles. And I think we stopped a couple of guys from over there with arrows. But evidently, I just wanted to know that where do the, the Audubon Society stand on that? Yeah, uh, I haven't seen the eagles this year. Um, sure. The eagles can be, they, they can be there one year and gone the next, especially mm -hmm. once you get young that are starting to raise. They, they will, uh, before they're sexually mature, they'll start endeavoring to create nests and, and start making attempts at nest building. So sometimes you think the nest, the, there's going to be an eagle nester that year, and then you go back and nothing ever happens. So unfortunately, I don't know for sure what's what's happening with those, but uh, there's there's plenty of habitat uh, along the, the little cow farm. Thank you. Mr. Wischlitzky. I just want to reiterate what you said, uh, there. I've drive past the uh, Highland Mercury on a daily basis. And the, the change is, is completely 100% different than it was three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. But now we just have to sustain that work to make sure we don't backslide. So, got to stay proactive. Mr. Gustaki, um, when you talk about plugs, what, what are you plugging and how many, like when you guys go out and do a major effort, what do you, how many are you planting? So, a plug is just like a, a, a plant that's already started growing. It's in a little cell, probably about six to eight inches of soil. And what we do is we go out there and the wetter it is in September, we're going to be working in a pretty monkey area. So it's pretty easy. You just get a, a spade or a, a, a little metal bar, create a little opening. You pop the plant in, you can pack the soil and it's, it's wet uh, almost all year. So last year we planted in August, which is, we were wondering if that was a little bit too late. And those plants have, I would say over 95% survival of those plugs. Um, as we get better at, uh, at planting these, uh, we've, we've participated in efforts in other places where you get 40 well-trained volunteers, you can plant 20,000 plugs in uh, a couple hours. So we're, we're just starting our process right now. Uh, we're starting slow. As Harry said, we, we got about uh, 1,500, 2,000 plugs. We're going to make pretty short work of that. Uh, but that's kind of like a good indication that we're not necessarily fully in the next phase of work, but we're starting to get from the stage of purely invasive species control and we're starting to get towards enhancement. So it's a good, it's a good step to be in it. And then I have another question. So we, we fought the war and we want some ground back. How long do you need to monitor and then what steps are necessary to monitor as we move five years down the road? Um, I hesitate to give you this answer, but it's 
forever. forever. <laughs> it's forever. But yeah. as the That's effort kind of increases, you're 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 paying people less to go out there and actually kill the invasive species. And you're hiring people to just go and monitor and identify when there's a new crop that's that's popping up. But we've been working a lot kind of in the interior in the cores of these habitats. And another kind of in the next phase of work, we might consider trying to prioritize working along the buffers and areas where Phragmites might be able to recolonize it. Thank you. So, so the goal just to add to that is to do similar to what we've been doing here within the watershed is to partner with some other uh, entities specifically to stay within DOT and those that you know are right next to it because personally we spend all this time and effort trying to fix a couple of these areas and all surrounding it is all fragmented growing so it has to be something that continues to be incorporated to all the projects that we do and uh, as long as we can have folks like you that are going to be committed to the project for a significant number of years, it helps to have the same uh, boots on the ground to use one of the past 15 kernels that we've been through, right, Dan? Um, six. So that would be uh, important. And as you, go, you guys go through those particular things, if you see areas that are close by to some of where we're currently working, there's going to be that next phase or that next stage that would be helpful as well to be able to continue to do that, including Lake County Parks and the initiative that they have to do, because we would hate to see some of the other local partners growing this stuff while we're trying to knock it out. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bra next, Mr. Whitaker. All Mr. good. Mr. Chair, I have one, uh, Mr. Whitaker. Comment, maybe a question, I suppose, but um, that was a great presentation, by the way. When you guys gave the number of increase, I think it was 221 or 226, um, is there a forecast that based on that particular geographic location where the species count increase that you would expect for it to be over a given period of time? Commissioner Cosbeck, you said, you know, five years from now, you mentioned five years from now, what would you expect to see and my second question is, um, is there anything related to um, the, the weight or the uh, amount of omissions that are being prevented as a result of this and species, uh, um, invasive species being removed and native species being um, placed back in the area? Is there any type of a of a number associated with uh, improper gases uh, being prevented or removed. So, for your for your first question, in terms of like being able to predict uh, how many how many uh, detections or how many species we should see, that's really hard to tell. Just because um, what we do to take care of the birds while they're in Northwest Indiana, we can't guarantee that they'll be well taken care of everywhere else along their their journey. So. Some species that we treasure as rare birds might be seen as agricultural pests when they go down to Central or South America where they spend their winters. Um, so it's too hard to tell. That being said, we do have data. Um, we, have a, we have an online hub of our data, the, the Marsh Bird Monitoring Hub. And part of that is um, basically it, it, we, we have a score for uh, what we would anticipate for the percentage chance that one of our 11 focal species would be nesting at one of the sites. So in other words, looking at uh, where birds have nested in the past, looking at data from across the birds uh, species range on where they're nesting, we can kind of make an educated guess for the likelihood that with all of the invasive species work we've done, uh, with the percentage of open water versus upland habitat, it's, it's, very, it's very technical. But we do, we can estimate a particular species presence, whether that's year to year. It's not like we can guess that in 2027 we'll get a, a very rare bird to show up, but we know that average across years uh, that there will be a percent chance that those species will be there. It might not end up that way, but it's the best that we have right now with the data. As we collect more data, as we add more and more years, uh, that data will get refined and we'll be able to make more educated guesses. Um, with regard to the second question, so if I'm if I'm if I understood correctly, you're talking about uh, as invasive species are removed and native species are replacing them. What types of are were you talking about like ecosystem services and and were you talking about like emissions like uh, uh, how that's for climate change considerations or did I did I misunderstand what you were asking? Climate change, gas emissions. 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the native species, so much uh, research shows this, that native species have uh, way more what we call ecosystem services. So basically things that they provide that humans value. So that could be water retention, water purification, carbon storage, and all of the wetlands that we're working on uh, provide those valuable services. The, the Great Lakes coastal wetlands of which the Little Cal is part of um, are some of the most important habitats that we have in terms of carbon sequestration. Most people tend to think of woods as being the, the only things that, that lock in trees, but the carbon that is stored in our wetlands stays underground, whether, whether the plants die uh, as opposed to a tree, who store, they store their carbon in the tree itself. So if that tree dies, that uh, carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere. So yes, uh, across all measures, the, the ecosystem services that healthy habitats provide is uh, leaps and bounds above what a field of drag might is worth. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. Anything else? Is answer any good? Yeah.